Hello and welcome to the Cookbook Circle podcast. I'm Hannah. And I'm Victoria. And we've set out to review the UK's most popular cookbooks, those that you probably have at home and haven't opened in a while. We take one cookbook each episode to cook from and to stretch test, digging out their best recipes, bringing them to life again, and hopefully inspiring you to do so too. Hello, Hannah. Hi, Victoria. <laughs> that was enthusiastic, wasn't it? Me or you? Both of us. Oh. Well, mostly me, though, I was talking about, because I'm, you know, egomaniac. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we always say about you. <laughs> this would be the name of my cookbook, <laughs> Victoria, egomaniac. <laughs> Kitchen egomaniac. <laughs> <laughs> also, ecomaniac. Ew. Uh, <laughs> let's just finish here. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the podcast this week. Bye. Um, <laughs> Hannah, what have you got to tell me about today? Well, <laughs> I've built this up ridiculously with Vic because she keeps saying, what are you going to talk about tomorrow? And I'm like, I'm not telling you. I'm very excited. <laughs> it's nothing new. I think we need to throw it back <laughs> occasionally. We're always talking about the hot new thing or what's in the news and the current affairs. Always. I'm going vintage with one of my favorite foodie films and I swear this isn't just an exercise to prove that I watch things other than Ratatouille (laughs) yeah yeah but I don't know if you've seen it actually Big Night oh no never seen it (gasps) yes this was what I was hoping for okay (laughs) great so have you heard anything about it I feel like no I feel like I'm not maybe you'll jog my memory when you talk about it but I feel like it's not on your radar Mm. honestly lads I was so into this last night I watched the whole thing again but I kind of just want to know if anyone's watched it and they love it or if they think I'm being a bit nuts when I talk about it but basically it's Stanley Tucci I feel like you love Stanley Tucci don't you I really love Stanley Tucci I just googled it and <laughs> yes. I have seen pictures of that. I guess the, there's a scene with a big thing with, with spaghetti. So I know that picture. They make this big thing called a timpano, which is right. like with homemade pasta. And it's like a pasta pie almost in the shape of a drum. And it's got this filling, which has got like meatballs and cured meats and hard boiled eggs and tomato sauce and stuff. And it's kind of this like big centerpiece at the big night at the dinner that they throw but yeah so it's Stanley Tucci I do love Stanley Tucci because I just think he's great and I listen to him on Dolly Alderton's love story podcast Mm -hmm. love stories I just thought he sounded like the nicest man ever and he really loves food so basically it's like two brothers in America they've come from Italy and they're trying to make it work their restaurant work Stanley Tucci is the more kind of like business mind front of house and his brother is the chef and the chef is really precious about you know it's classic restaurant like trying to make it work trying to balance the actual business side of things Mm. with what people want to order and then like staying true to your food thing or your food kind of ethos as well there's a really great scene at the beginning where there's two Americans sitting in the restaurant and they're asking they order the risotto the risotto (laughs) and they um she gets it and she's really disappointed because she thought it would come with spaghetti on the side <laughs> and he's Danny Tucci's like trying to hide his irritation and be like really polite and be like well no well like risotto is this you know it's rice it's a starch so you don't need spaghetti on the side and he has to go back into the kitchen and get spaghetti on the side of this risotto and the chef <laughs> his brother the chef just like blows up because it's fucking ridiculous so just just lots of really great scenes in this there's a lot of food chat in there and a lot about kind of authentic Italian cuisine and there's this obviously the big night itself there's like this massive multi-course dinner yeah loads of courses like a suckling pig and like a whole roasted fish and timpano and everyone's just like loving it and so stuffed and dying it's just one of my favorites and the the last scene it's not going to spoil it but it's just this very silent scene where nobody (laughs) talks but Stanley Tucci just makes an omelet for everyone and then they all sit down and eat it and it's just like this really great kind of bonding power of food and oh I just love it love it you love that you have to watch it okay I watch it I feel like it eated the list right at the beginning of lockdown about like the best foodie stuff to watch yeah whilst you're lockdown I feel like this was like at the top of it because I remember that picture yeah Ah. Um, but I thought it fell in nicely with your favorite current TikTok trend of oh my gosh Italian boyfriends (laughs) oh my god it's my favorite tiktok thing and like now tiktok is just serving it to me and like you know excuse the pun and it is dreamy it's this tiktok trend where it's often american women who are married to or partnered up with italian men and they they video themselves doing something 
that they know that their boyfriend will hate. <laughs> that is very non-Italian. So the first one I ever saw was they're in this, I guess, this pizzeria in Italy. And yeah. she says, she's like, babe, do you think they'll put pineapple on my pizza <laughs> if I ask for it? And then her boyfriend's reaction. <laughs> it's just like you know it's the whole hand thing and then he's like my love i can't live here if you ask for pineapple on your pizza this is me say like you know i cannot live with my fiance asking <laughs> for a pineapple on her pizza and his face is so serious yeah yeah and i saw another one where i mean go go and find them out i don't know how you I, I don't think the hashtag italian boyfriend but you might might have seen them but yeah there's another one where she's like i'm getting the pasta ready and like he comes in he's like what pasta then she has this whole like handful of linguine and she like snaps it in half to put it in the pan <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm saying is the chef or the brother in Big Night is the original Italian boyfriend, <laughs> nice. I think. I would love it. But, but that's not what we're talking about. Unfortunately, that's not what we're talking about. I would like to t- talk you through all of my favourite TikToks of the of the moment. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm watching films from the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we have another book to talk about today. Hmm. And before we get to that, let me tell you a little bit about what we do here on the old cookbook circle. If it is your first time, which, you know, welcome, if that's the case. So we have collated all the lists we could find of all the best cookbooks ever. And each episode, we take one of the top books and we read it, we cook from it, we talk about it, we find out all we can about the chef, and then we rate it in our very special cookbook circle rating system. This is book 14. Whoa. How are people still listening? <laughs> Why are you still listening? <laughs> Why are you not sick of our shit yet? Thank you. We love you. Thank you. Please, please stay listening. <laughs> so today's book is We Are Back in England. We haven't been in England for a while. No. When was the last, actually? Nigel, maybe? Maybe, yeah. Yeah, with Delia Smith, who you may have heard of if you're British. You definitely will have. But if you're outside, I don't know how popular she is. That's the thing. Yeah, I'm not sure what how big she is outside of the UK. Yeah, nor me. But she's very, very, very popular here. Is she our Julia Child? Maybe. But so the book is How to Cook. I keep calling it How to Eat. <laughs> Which is my jealous book from the first episode. How to Cook. How to Cook. Complete. So I think originally this was three different books. Uh, right. And now it's one complete book. It was a TV series. And so this was the book to go alongside it. I bet that TV series, I think that was like the original before they had, you know, really good food stylists or great lighting or anything like that. It's, it's a bit retro, that one, I think, if memory serves. Yeah, you can watch a lot of it online. I, I was having a look yesterday so it came out in like 1999 I think yeah. so later than I thought yeah so it's it, it's okay but it's it's still very like well we'll talk about it but it's very English there's a lot of English food in this which you know mixed food if you don't know what that is it's bland <laughs> um <laughs> But maybe I'm on board. Let's see. Um, do you want to know a little bit about Ardelia? Yes, please. She's very interesting. Is she? Well, I say that. She's she's more interesting than I thought, but also less interesting than I thought. That She doesn't seem to have any, like, fun, like, scandals or anything like that, which is sad. Yeah. You know, with other chefs, so with Jamie Oliver or Nigella Lawson, there's lots of interviews with them and you can hear what, what they're talking about, what they're thinking. I couldn't find that much about Delia. Like, wow. She lets her books and TV shows do the talking. She's like Beyonce or something. <laughs> she she is. She's the original Beyonce, which actually we'll come to with this whole first name thing. But she's very multi multifaceted. That's what's quite interesting about it. So she celebrated her 80th birthday this year Whoa. in June. Wow. So she bought her first cookbook out in 1971. Okay. So she's celebrating 50 years in writing cookbooks and in the food industry, which is insane. So she was born in Woking in the south of England. She was not hugely successfully academically, which I absolutely love. Yeah. Left school at 16 with no qualifications whatsoever. Mm. Went to be hairdresser. Didn't do that. Didn't end up doing that. Worked in various retail jobs for a few years. And then when she was 20. 21, she started working in a small restaurant in London 
Ah. And that's how she kind of got into food. So she started off dishwashing, then she was a waitress, and then they let her kind of start touching the food and working with the food. That classic, like, hazing induction <laughs> to a restaurant kitchen. Yeah. Once you know how to wash the dishes, then you can touch the food. <laughs> yeah. But obviously that kind of sparked her interest in her because she then spent a lot of her spare time in the British Library oh. reading room, reading cookbooks reading old English cookbooks and learning all about food so that was her it seems to be her education that's so cool yeah she didn't go to culinary school or anything like that yeah. so she just kind of figured it out all this stuff you could do like before the internet like it yeah, <laughs> she yeah. could just I'm just gonna go to the British library and spend the day there because you know I can't get all that information in the palm of my hand yeah which makes it even more admirable like the dedication yeah I can just imagine her sitting there with this pile of books learning how to cook and then going into uh, she was living with a family so she wasn't living with her family she was living in a, with a family in London and she would like test these recipes out on them which oh, is fun I see a, a film in the making here that would be great a little Billy Elliot style <laughs> but for Delia so that all happened so she was she was cooking and then in 1969 so she would have been in like her late 20s she was hired as the Daily Mirror's food writer for their new magazine wow you know things that don't happen these days <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna write about the food yeah. full time. Here's some money. <laughs> it's it's probably lots of yeah, money. Yeah, yeah. And it seems like that is how she got into her media career, how she mm. started working on that. Because I think also she did a couple of jobs like as a food stylist before then and things like that. Side note, she was hired by the Daily Mirror at that time and then married and is continually married to the deputy editor at the Mirror. <laughs> from that time well that's things that do happen nowadays <laughs> in media yeah. Yeah. that little trend persists oh you know someone oh that's fine yeah here's the job <laughs> <laughs> So then she was like working in newspapers. She bounced around. She was at the Evening Standard and the Radio Times. And, you know, she's just writing columns and stuff, which is pretty cool. Um, uh. She published her first book, How to Cheat at Cooking in 1971. And then she kind of re-released that book and re-kind of did it in 2008. So there's two versions of that book. And that's uh. all about basically how to use like off the shelf ingredients and cheese like soup like soup yes that's what i was gonna say um i would love her they would be fast friends <laughs> and apparently she got criticized for that at the time gary rhodes wasn't a fan i think that's what i read it was probably for people on a budget who were trying to cook for a family you can't all be doing all michelin star stuff all the time yeah so as you kind of will see in this book and all of her other books she's like dedicated to like doing the basics teaching people how mm -hmm. to cook the basics of it you know she doesn't she thinks that there's nothing that even an experienced chef can't learn from going back to basics and doing things kind of simply yeah. which you, you've got to respect she's known for like speaking in very kind of plain English not making it fussy or fancy you know she says the ingredients as they are rather than their French name or whatever which obviously I love but she's a big fan as we started, said of like already mixed ingredients so like pre-rolled pastry frozen vegetables etc yeah she according to various sources is the highest selling cookery writer of all time all time of all time i i figured out she's got about 24 cookery books and she sold over 21 million copies holy mother yeah so here's some like fun delia facts i love this is where she comes into being multifaceted and like fun yeah so early in her career in 1969 there's a rolling stones album called let it bleed yeah do you know that one yes i've heard of it and the front cover of that album is a picture of like a record player and then a cake okay and she made that cake shut up yeah that's a fun fact <laughs> yeah what delia and mick jagger just hanging out <laughs> eating cake yeah it looks like honestly the most disgusting cake like it's very i guess of its time like late 60s oh we'll put it up on instagram yeah so she made that cake and like so early on in her career like as she was just starting at the mirror. I've just looked up the cake. Sorry, it's very funny looking. It looks like when they try to make sushi look like cake. <laughs> something. Yes, that's such a good way of putting it. <laughs> it's very strange. We'll share it. Um, my second fun fact about her is that she created this thing called the Delia effect. Oh. Which is if she ever mentioned an ingredient or a product or something that she swear by using, it would sell out. 
she's the original influencer. She's the original influencer, food influencer. And the stats about this are insane. So this book that we're talking about, How to Cook, has a picture of an egg on the front of it. Yeah. And it, like I said, it was a TV show. There's heavy egg content in here. Lots right? of How eggs. to boil an egg, how to poach an egg, how to fry an egg, how to make an omelet. It's all in there. So I think maybe the first one or two episodes of that series were about eggs. Mm. She seems to think that if you can't cook an egg, then you're fucked, basically, for cooking. So basically, after this TV show came out, egg sales in the UK increased by 10%. Whoa. They're putting that all down to Delia Smith. Huh. But some of the other ones are crazy. So I read about... She was in an advert, I think, for Waitrose, right. uh, making a seafood risotto. Okay. I don't, in like the late 2000s. Right. And after that advert, sales of frozen fruit de mer to make risotto increased by 716%. Holy crap. Like, what is it about Delia then? Like, we'll get into this, I'm sure. But it's just, is she, uh, she is maybe the Julia Child or the kind of Stephanie Alexander of the UK in just that whatever she says is kind of gospel. Yeah, I think so. But it's mad. She's just really found her way into people's hearts. Yeah. That 760% thing, I couldn't believe it. Like, for a seafood risotto, like, who wants to make that? I mean, I'm sure it's lovely. I bet they were really low beforehand, like, because nobody really knew what to do with them. <laughs> so then they're like, oh, you can make a risotto. <laughs> yeah. She did something the same for, like, an omelette pan that she talked about, one of her shows. Like, it's crazy. So that's the dealer effect. Can we get her to talk about the podcast? That would <laughs> yeah. be nice. <laughs> can you tweet about us? I don't know if she has Twitter. <laughs> she also also was a trail not a trailblazer I don't think she meant to do this but she was the original first name only chef oh. so Delia was entered into the Collins English Dictionary <gasps> about her and so oh. you know Nigella and Jamie could never and so she was the original <laughs> one of that so like wow De everyone knows who Delia is when we talk about Delia yeah, but yeah, yeah she yeah. was entered into the dictionary everyone knows her by her just her first name like that's so cool that's brilliant um so well done on these fun facts by the way I know great work I've got a couple more fun facts if it's okay these are away from cooking okay so like of course we can't talk about her without talking about her football <laughs> her love of football she is a huge fan and her and her husband are majority shareholders of Norwich City Football Club. Yeah. Who were recently promoted to the Premier League. Thank you to my husband for that. <laughs> And I was researching, I was like, can you talk to me a little bit about Norwich? <laughs> so yeah, so she's incredibly passionate about the club. <laughs> and she's she's been a majority shareholder for ages. She also was like head of catering at the club. Duh. Um, Yeah, re she recently stepped down from... Eggs, we're just eating loads of eggs. <laughs> yeah, eggs, eggs sandwiches galore. <laughs> I wonder if it was good catering, I bet it was. Like, yeah. Have you ever been to a football match? Like the food is not great. Yeah, I don't, not many. <laughs> I have. The food is not great. <laughs> Although I grew up in Birmingham. So for the football, you have these like balty pies. Ah. Because it's like Birmingham. Yeah. Curry is a big influence. But yeah, they're amazing. You can't really get that them anywhere else. great. Yeah. Anyway, that's off topic. But if you don't love food or you don't know about cookbooks, you know Delia Smith from this clip that Hannah talked about <laughs> at the end of last episode where she's at a, a match and I think it's half time and it went basically it went viral before things went viral, I think. And you can find it anywhere. Um, we might play it. <laughs> <laughs> she's on the match at half time and she's trying to rile the crowd up she thinks they're being too quiet and to get behind the team but as you can imagine she's quite a posh english lady yeah uh, hannah i don't know if you want to do your impression of what she what she does I, when i watched it vic sent it to me the other night because she was she's clearly hammered here which i had never really picked up on before i think it's been a few years since i watched it and she <laughs> she's like falling back on her <laughs> she's swaying <laughs> I'm sorry, there's something about this clip that really tickles me every time I watch it. But is she saying, come on? And she's like, come on. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Let's be having you. <laughs> Oh, it's so funny. And it's funny as well because she denied being drunk, but she's obviously drunk. Like her eyes are glazed over and she's like, come on, guys, we need a, a 12th man. Where are you? <laughs> Come on! So where are you? <laughs> A message for the best first of all supporters in the world. We need a 12th man here. Where are you? Where are you? Let's be having you! Come on! Where are you? <laughs> 
that's the best part. Where are you? Yeah. It's like this like Larry football fan inside this little posh woman. <laughs> it's so good. It is so good. It's great. So yeah, she's a massive football fan, which is, you know, hilarious, to be honest, like in itself. But yeah, that clip is, it's the cherry on the cake. <laughs> Excuse the <laughs> one. So my final fun fact is that she converted to Catholicism as an adult. Oh. Yeah, so she was grew up in like a Church of England family, but then converted mm. to Catholicism. She's she's deeply religious still and has written four religious books. Wow. One about Lent, one about Advent, like one that's like a prayer book. Yeah, I didn't know that either. All right, my, I've, I've got a very <laughs> amazed expression because you just don't hear about many people going the other way, you know? Yeah. <laughs> These yeah. days, it's usually just heading right on out that church door and just <laughs> yeah. keeping walking. <laughs> Ripping that veil off and getting out of there. Wow, go do yeah yeah she's she's, she's a complex human. like i said she's fascinating like but yeah. you know not not too much like gossip apart from that clip and then the, apparently there was one recipe she put uh for like a seafood i think a seafood like pie that she put up and that was like so bad that no many people like, the recipe was so bad and tasted so bad that like, a load of people complained about it <laughs> there's like oh, a, no way. there's like an article on daily mail about how bad it was <laughs> <laughs> oh, such a shame to have one bad recipe taint years of decent ones. Yeah, I feel like it, I feel like it doesn't. But yeah, she's still super active in the cooking world. So she has a website called Delia Online. You get basically all of her recipes on there. And she's also there often, like in the comments, like chatting to members and her fans and, and giving advice and stuff. So she's still super active. And then I read that she's just, so in her 80th year, she just signed to write a new book, but it's Ooh. gonna be like a lifestyle book, <laughs> philosophy and advice book. Shut the front door. Yeah, so that's coming. Well, I mean, the tone throughout this book is very much one of kind of maternal or like anti-advice, isn't it? The way, yes. the way she speaks is like, this is what you you need to do it's all very instructional and calming and yeah a bit like an agony aunt yeah i think so like she very much like yeah mothers you through yeah which i guess you might need if if you don't know how to cook which yeah. i would need if i didn't know how to cook and still need really yeah so the book couldn't find much out about the book but, but i think because it goes along the tv series the tv series was a little bit more popular in terms right. of what people talked about so that started in 1998 I think maybe I said before it's 99, but 98. The book and the TV show, I think very no nonsense, like you said, like tells you what to do, explains it, it's very specific. A lot of the ingredients she uses, I think are very specific, like... Mm. In one of my recipes, she suggests a specific kind of stock cube. Oh, same. Yeah. So that was weird. I couldn't find that. It's interesting. I don't know what you thought of the book. I thought it was very British. It feels very British, I think, in tone and also in the actual food that she's cooking. What did you think? There are a couple of more uh, exotic dishes in there, like oh, yeah. Thai beef salad and Mexican enchiladas. <laughs> yeah. Don't forget them. Mexican guacamole, I saw. <laughs> to be honest, it's a fine line for me between familiar and just like, huh, this is not daunting. This looks all very doable. It's quite, it's big and it's got like one recipe per page. And if, did you like the pictures, Vic? There was a picture for almost every recipe. Yeah, I love the picture. <laughs> that's what the, that's what you need if you learn to cook. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> no skinning rabbit diagrams here. No, sadly not. But um, yeah, so I felt like when I opened it, I was kind of like, ah. Oh, this is nice, isn't it? It's all very doable. Mm. And there were a few recipes that caught my eye. And then in thinking about what to say today here to you all, <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't know how much I'm going to have to say about it, if you yeah. know what I mean. So it's, a, yeah, like I said, it's a fine line between kind of comforting and familiar and then it's just a bit nondescript if that makes sense yeah I don't feel angry about it but I don't it's not my favorite book that yeah we've done yeah, for yeah. sure but it, yeah I think you're right it's very it's it's very like calming I didn't feel stressed yeah that's good. going through it maybe we need to add stress as one of our ratings <laughs> No, my stress level is always high. So <laughs> we're both just very anxious people. Yeah, yeah, it's it's big. It's, it is big. You can tell that it was used to be three books. Yeah, I feel like we should talk about the fact that there's a dieting section. Yes, called Waste Watchers, and there's a lot of diet chat. To be honest, all the way yeah. through. 
there is which is very of its time as well isn't it i don't know if it's just me or the general trend that is just a bit like sick of hearing about diet so i mean at the time probably if i was 20 and i was reading that i'd be like oh great this is good to know you know i'm watching my waist <laughs> but now yeah at 32 I couldn't give a shit mostly no could not give a shit i have i don't know if you have the same version but i have the the kind of redone version from 2009 yeah. and so she has an intro in it I mean even like she don't think she's taken anything out but she just kind of says it's more important now than ever to learn to cook uh we're in an age of ready meals takeaways all day grazing on water or snacks and confectionery blah 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 government concerned with health she says the o word which we won't say and I just think like fuck off like I hate this stuff. When we started this podcast, we decided we'd never do a diet book yeah. because it's just fucking boring. Like it's boring, like hateful, hate your body chat in it. Yeah. And that's for us, I don't think is what food is about. No. And so I ignored that whole section. Yeah. Which is unfortunate because there's some decent looking stuff in there, mm. but if it had just been pitched maybe slightly better or maybe even yeah. incorporated into the rest, it didn't need to be called out and everyone has a mind of their own and can choose what, you know, how much bloody exactly. cream and butter they want to eat on a daily basis, then maybe that would be fine. But I agree. And I, I don't love it in the whole food conversation. And there's a part where she does say about ready meals and how we're eating more like chocolate. The number of chocolate bars that we eat in a week equates to it drinking like a, a carton of double cream or something, but then fails to kind of address any of the kind of larger societal things at stake yeah. that might be influencing this. So that's always the, the problem, isn't it? If we just yeah. are a bit blamey and pointing the finger at the person rather than the context in which the person. Is yeah, in. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, Delia. Yeah, it's not about personal responsibility, lads. So we're not interested in that shit. But the rest of the book, fine. It does have a lot of swaps in there. Like the, uh, the recipe that I did at the bottom says like, if you want to save calories on this, like do this instead. And I was like, oh, fuck <laughs> off. But yeah, I, like you said, like people know how to eat healthy. You don't need to write it in a book. And I think they knew in 2009. I think they knew in 1999. Mm. Like, anyway. anyway. Do you want to talk about what you cooked? Well, if I say no, <laughs> would you? <laughs> Will you please? <laughs> sure. Since you asked so nicely. I actually only cooked two things for this book, which is... <laughs> what? I quit. Very uncharacteristic. But, you know, it's the new me. I'm really breezy and cool. So I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Are you on a diet? <laughs> uh, I think previously when I've only done two, it's because they've been really labor intensive, like Thomas Keller or Julia Child or something. But it's actually not a slight on the book. I just... Just been so busy. <laughs> No, well, I made two things. The first thing I made was a soup. Ooh. And I think I've been making a lot of soups on the podcast. So I don't want everyone to think that I'm some kind of like false teeth boomer. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> false reason... teeth boomer is a band name of the week. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, there's nothing wrong with soup or false teeth boomers. But <laughs> the reason I made this one was twofold. Partly because I had all of the ingredients from my odd box, which is our odd box mention of the week as well. <laughs> and also I'd had loads of dentist stuff done and I thought soup would be... Oh, you were a false teeth boomer. <laughs> I was a false teeth boomer. I was post-traumatic root canal. Don't want to chew anything. Oh. Yeah, so I made the pumpkin soup with toasted sweet corn. Oh, I almost did this one. Did you? Yeah, but I didn't. Well, because we both probably got butternut squash in <laughs> yeah. our veggie box, right? And I got fresh corn as well. So I literally had everything. And it is, I think it's a slightly strange combination. I don't think I've thought about squash and sweet corn together before mm. or pumpkin and sweet corn. But yeah, it's very simple. Like you said, she does recommend that you use a certain stock cube, which is a marigold Swiss bouillon stock. Same for me, but is that the one that comes in like a, a pot? I think so, yeah. I feel like I can imagine it, but... If she was an influencer now, she'd be like, use the code DELIA10 for... <laughs> yes! 10% Click off. here, add affiliate link. <laughs> 
Yeah, you literally chop up the squash or pumpkin with half of the fresh corn after you sweat an onion. Sorry, you do that first. Put the lid on and let them steam away for about 10 minutes. And then you pour in some milk and stock and cook it all up. There's nothing revolutionary here in terms of soup making. But what you do do then is you preheat the grill and you toss some the rest of the sweet corn in the recipe in melted butter and you put it under the grill and you toast it till it gets all nice and golden and crisp. Nice. Which took a little bit that longer than she said it would be, but um, I think maybe my, my grill just wasn't feeling it that day either. But uh, yeah, and then you liquidize the whole batch of soup and you just serve it with the toasted sweet corn on top. And it was really nice. It was definitely, it needed salt. And I think mm. we'll always instinctively add salt anyway, but when I'm doing the recipes for this, I always try not to just to see if they mention that you should at a certain yes. point, because if someone didn't know or they, they always say, don't they, that like the difference between restaurant quality food and yours is that you're probably not using enough salt and you're probably not using as much fat. So I always yeah. think it's interesting to see if recipes mention it. And she doesn't really. So obviously you had the stock cube and maybe that particular brand of stock is very salty. Yeah. So it's definitely under season. So fix that. But it was lovely. Uh, yeah, I'm still not fully convinced on squash and corn as a combo is it too sweet if i can obviously like two sweet vegetables yeah. like do you need something to cut through that yeah i think maybe so and also the corn actually kind of overpowered a little bit for me the mm. squash so it was lovely and the the toasted corn adds like a nice texture mm. thing to it and it's actually just really delicious on its own just like toasted corn with butter yeah i bet but yeah that was quite good but the second thing i made was a little bit more involved and that was the gnocchi with sage butter Ooh. and parmesan yeah chosen by your cat chosen by my cat so I put up on Instagram, our Instagram, as I was looking through this book, a picture of our cat Pepper lying across the book and not really letting me turn the page or look at it <laughs> as she, you know, she just likes to sabotage all of my daily activities. And she, it was, it was on the Noki page. So yeah, she's she definitely picked that one out for us. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks Pep. Peps. I've never made Noki before from scratch, have you? No, I've always wanted to. There's a recipe in Ottolenghi flavour that I'm desperate to try. It's like, oh. um, I think it's turn it. Swede, Swede yeah. yes. Swede gnocchi with miso butter. And that sounds incredible. Anyway, that's not the book we're talking about here. <laughs> but I would love to talk about that book one day. Yeah. I've never made it either. And I think my sister Ursula tried to make it once and had a bit of a disaster. And mm. I think it's put me off since then because I was just like, ugh, I don't want to do this. But this recipe looked pretty doable. And it was. It was actually a really great recipe. So you just boil up some potatoes in their skins and then you peel them while they're hot. So I guess the reason you don't peel them before is because you get more flavor, right? But um, then you mm. put them, you peel them while they're hot and then you put the potatoes in a big bowl and you use an electric hand whisk to blitz them up so that there's no lumps. But she loves. Yes, I think she does love them. But I love them too. Like I actually, for someone who cooks all the time, I have like an embarrassingly low number of gadgets and like tools in my kitchen. I just like bootstrap everything. But yeah, so you whisk them, which I'd never thought to do. I, th I always thought you would have put it through like a ricer or just mash them up or something. But this mm. is actually great because you get it really, really smooth before letting it cool. And then you add some sifted flowers and some beaten egg and you season and you bring it all together and you kind of knead it into a dough and then you just put it into like a sausage shape and then cut them on the diagonal into little pieces. I didn't do a very good job at cutting them very equally, I'm not going to lie. And then you... <laughs> chill <laughs> you chill them for half an hour she says but longer doesn't matter so I think I left them for a bit longer and then you you're meant to take them out and you're meant to like press your fork into them to yeah to get the kind of prongs but also you're meant to kind of shape it at the same time into a crescent shape and that was not working for me at all <laughs> it was just like they kept sticking to the surface even though I oh, no. it and then sticking to the fork I think it was just my dough was, or my whatever you call it dough was like a bit too sticky so I kind of gave up on that halfway through to be honest and put them back in the fridge and I actually made them the day before I needed them and they sat in the fridge for 24 nice. hours and I don't think it affected them at all so hot tip of the day oh <laughs> and then you just cook them the way you cook gnocchi so you just boil up some water and then you boil them I think for about three minutes so they come to the top after about two minutes and then she says to leave them for another minute and you do you just melt some butter and toast it with garlic and you're meant to put sage leaves in there 
and I couldn't get sage. I don't want to make London sound like some kind of barren ingredient wasteland. <laughs> it was just that I was in a rush and I couldn't find any. So I used thyme, which was also nice. great. And then you just spoon that warm butter mixture over the gnocchi. Oh, that sounds nice. So actually, when you have the gnocchi made, and again, it can sit in your fridge for a while, that whole process of cooking it takes literally like yeah, less than 10 minutes. Really easy and great. Yeah. And it was very delicious because the garlic and the herbs have all kind of infused in the butter Mm. and then you've got these lovely fresh little dumplings I would say that I prefer gnocchi when it's toasted in the pan Mm -hmm. when it gets a bit crispy yeah so I did half like the recipe ate it went out watched the football had many (laughs) the England's final in the Euros yeah I was forced to watch it and we have a new there's a lot of football shot today <laughs> had quite a few drinks and then came home and was like wait I'm gonna toast up the rest of the night <laughs> <laughs> the whole country's depressed and you're like I don't give a fuck about England I'm not English fuck them well in Italy <laughs> but I'm gonna fire my knocky up so <laughs> is that a euphemism <laughs> yeah always um, <laughs> and oh my god that was 10 times better in my book and that obviously had nothing to do with the amount of alcohol that had been consumed but (laughs) the contrast then between the crispy outside and the little fluffy inside is just Mm. really good and yeah it was delicious so do you but you boil then fry them or just fry them yeah so I had already boiled everything oh okay (laughs) <laughs> and only eaten half and then just put the leftovers in the fridge so then to heat the leftovers up I just fried them it was great nice that is great fucking delicious actually so <laughs> yeah that's what I made lovely do you think you'd make the gnocchi again 100% actually I really would because you could really have you could have some fun you know <laughs> you could have some fun <laughs> yeah. playing around with different sauces and stuff like that she also yeah. has a semolina gnocchi with gorgonzola recipe in this which looks decadent af it's like <laughs> it's like a big baked tray with like the gnocchi mm. and this cheesy blue cheesy sauce Ooh. so yeah I would like to try that as well but yeah I, I would 100% make that gnocchi again it didn't feel nice. it didn't didn't feel yeah stressful I felt fine I like gnocchi I feel like I don't eat it enough I should eat it more uh, but anyway what did you make anyway what did I make so I also maybe only cooked two things but also maybe made three wow. so because serious it's one recipe on the page but it really has two recipes in it so we're quite on those two oh, you're using that one are you yeah <laughs> you're using that line <laughs> so I win today <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, so I, for I think for the first time in Cookbook Soccer History, made a made a whole meal oh. out of um, recipes from this book. Gotcha. Which nice. is which was quite fun. You know, I was like, look, I'm leaning into this like British food landscape thing, and I'd been thinking about it a couple of weeks ago. And so I made toad in the hole with roasted onion gravy. Yes. Oh my god, I'm so happy because there's toad in the hole in here and there's spotted dick. <laughs> And I just like, for me, that's like some famous five shit that I just read about and have never actually tried. Have you never eaten a toad in the hole? Oh, I think I have maybe since. But like, isn't it sausages? Yeah, sausages. You can make it with veggie sausages for sure. Okay, yeah. I was like, fuck it, let's do it. And my husband, Stephen, has never eaten toad in the hole. Ah, see? Um, Because I was like, oh, you're not going to like this. And he was like, I don't think I've ever eaten it. And I was like, okay, fine, we'll try it. Yeah. Also, Delia refers in her little intro to this as fusion food. <laughs> I'll quickly read it to you. I can't give this high enough accolades. It's simply a wonderful creation from the humble origins of British cooking. If only you could order it in a restaurant, though. Can I persuade anyone? It is, after all, a sort of fusion food. (laughs) A fusion of light, crispy, crunchy batter and uh, plump, meaty pork sausages, all moistened with a generous amount of roasted onion jus. Here's hoping. I think she's hoping that you can get it in a restaurant, but you definitely can. Like, it's it's just in the microwave a lot of the time. I like shit pubs. That's not a fusion food to me, is (laughs) there? That's just more like a contrast of textures. (laughs) Sorry, Deals. Don't mean to call you out. Bless her. Love you. So if you don't know what toad in the hole is, which you may not, it is basically, it's so sausages. 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 In a savoury pancake batter. Like a like a Yorkshire pudding, if you know what a Yorkshire pudding is, or like a yeah. popover batter. And so you... You cook it all together in a pan, and so the the batter kind of puffs up around yeah. the sausages. When you think about it, it's, it's a bit weird and like disgusting. I don't really know what the point is of it, but it is nice. 
It's delicious. Where's I mean, the toad? Where does the name come from, I wonder? I don't know. I don't know. What is the hole and what is the toad? Like in that? I think it should be like <laughs> sausages in the hole, no? <laughs> I mean, I feel like... Pork in the hole? <laughs> pork in the hole and spotted dick for dessert. <laughs> Actually, her spotted dick is called Spotted Dick Rides Again. <laughs> Which for Irish people is particularly funny because we use ride in a whole other way. <laughs> She's very funny at some points in this. I don't think she means to be, but it is like quite like spotted dick rides again. Anyway. So the toe in the hole bit, very easy. You make a batter that is milk, flour, water, and salt and pepper. And you kind of whisk all that up. I did that in the KitchenAid with the whisk. My whisk is broken for the KitchenAid and I'm sad about it. Anyway, um, yeah. anyone want to send me a new one? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's fine. But I wish I hadn't. I wish I'd used the hand mixer. Oh. There wasn't enough batter to whip it up. Like it, right. it's not a, it's not a big recipe i suppose yeah interestingly about batter she says that people say and i've always thought that if you leave the batter to sit it gets better but yeah. she says she's never found that so do whatever you want ah love it yeah i will always leave like pancake batter to sit put it in the fridge like yeah. before i make pancakes but you put the sausages in the dish that you're going to cook it in so you need like a kind of high-sided baking dish so you put those in the oven for like 10 minutes to just kind of start off cooking mm. release some of the oil because you need that for the batter Batter. Yeah. you take them out if there's not that much oil really you should put a little bit more oil in it and then put it on the hob for a minute to like make sure that it's really really hot the, right. the tin is really really hot you then pour the batter in when it is and then you just put it in the oven for like 30 minutes okay yeah so i probably i think could have could have taken out a little bit earlier it was a bit crispy on the butt <laughs> um which is a shame but it was it wasn't burnt i feel like there's yorkshire pudding if you know anything about yorkshire pudding batter which i don't really i, I don't really worship at the altar of yorkshire puddings do you yeah i do actually i you really do. like them yeah i've been looking for the right recipe for a long time and i'm pleased to say oh. i found the one recently oh nice is yeah. it delia no it's james martin oh come on of course yeah I mean, anything with oil <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah he's from yorkshire isn't he yeah true yeah so it's like a very fine line right like you you want them to be puffy yeah but you don't want to be too crispy but you don't want them to be so, too soggy and it's a very difficult balance to hit the steaks are great you're cooking them in, in a giant pan <laughs> filled with sausages yeah you get some sog at the bottom usually but yeah. anyway it, it turned out all right to be honest like it, well, it didn't feel too soggy it, it didn't puff up loads and loads but it didn't not yeah i was i was happy with it as a first attempt of ever making toad in the hole anyway i'll talk about the gravy there's very many steps and stuff to this so you cut an onion up you roast that in the oven with the sausages at the beginning so yeah. you roast it on a higher shelf the onions before you, you make a little mixture of like sugar and oil right and you okay. toss the onions in that before you put them in so they kind of caramel like they kind of get that little kind of caramelized in the oven and then you add the onions to a pot, add some flour. And in the meantime, you get your stock, which also was this marigold one. Oh, yeah. She loves this. But I didn't use that. I used a different vegetable stock that I had. And you add Worcester sauce, mustard powder to the stock. And then you add that, the stock to the okay. onions and then you're like you you bring it up to a simmer you kind of so you start off with a wooden spoon then you have to get a whisk right. and whisk it till it's kind of all smooth and incorporated then you bring it up to a simmer and then you kind of turn it down and leave it till it kind of right. thickens up there's also some sugar in there and stuff but the gravy was great like it was i like thick gravy and i like onion gravy um so i was all about this one i think probably because of the stock it wasn't it's not as dark as you would imagine gravy yeah. to be. It was quite a light color, but that's because it's like vegetable stock. But so nice, like really flavorful and great. Loved it. Very good for on top of your toad in the hole, which generally is just, there's not that much flavor in it. Like your sausages are where the flavor is. Yeah. I would absolutely make that gravy again. That's good. And then so to go alongside that, I made her perfect mashed potato. Oh, wow. My God, this mashed potato. Oh, I'm changed. I'm a massive mashed potato fan. Me too. Again, I'm not a huge potato fan generally. No, we've discussed this. Unlike Hannah. Especially in the baby form. <laughs> But mashed potato is my okay. god. I could I could buy instant mashed potato and just eat it. I used to love I love school mashed potato when I was at school. I would just eat other people's because people hated it. Like I love it. It's so Hook good. Hook it up to my face. This recipe is so good. Is it? Yeah. I thought I had it down. I thought I could make mashed potato really good. But this one is for me. 
<laughs> on another level. This is Mina. I'm doing it this way. Okay. Tell me more. Potatoes. Yeah. Vital ingredients. She steamed them. Oh, yes. Uh, so that takes about half an hour. And then to the potatoes, you add butter. She says to use a dessert spoon of salt. Whoa. Yeah, that's a lot of salt. But then she does, doesn't mention, she doesn't say put it in. She just says taste it and add it at the end. Get a dessert spoon of salt. <laughs> Sprinkle it over your shoulder for good just, luck. Yeah. <laughs> Rid your house of demons and come back to the match. Just, <laughs> just make sure you have a dessert spoon of salt in your house. Please. <laughs> season your fucking food so you, to the mashed potatoes you add butter whole milk and creme fraiche oh yeah good show and pepper a little bit of pepper she says um and then you whip it up with a hand whisk ah uh, this is her thing for smooth potatoes and it goes so smooth mm. and it's fucking incredible wow. and i could have just eaten that on its own and i loved it i've never added creme, creme fraiche to to mashed potato yeah this was just perfect wow high praise loved it obviously with the bit of the gravy that i loved yeah. and if you want to make low-fat mashed potatoes don't bother but there's a, there's a little thing in here if you're desperate to add some weird dairy products that are low-fat to your anyway yes loved it so i had toad in the hole onion gravy and mashed potato for dinner with uh, some peas as well which is not that wasn't a recipe i just made the peas it was great that sounds great i think the batter for toad in the hole like bangers and mash that now that's a dinner yeah 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 with gravy but th so i feel like yeah the the batter for the toad in the hole didn't add a huge amount but it was fun to have and yeah yeah loved it nice there's something in like all the little tricks that we've learned along the way or the hacks mm. i think for samin nasra i was saying how she to cook garlic so as not to overcook it she always kind of makes a little well in the middle of whatever is cooking and you cook the garlic in there really quickly and then you just spread it into the rest of the stuff so that yeah. it doesn't burn and this thing with whisking the potatoes with a, one of those retro hand whisks. Yeah. I think that's a great hack. Maybe there's fucking millions of people doing this and I've never thought of it. But I always thought a ricer was like the the key to very smooth mash. Mm. But a pass not. This is the one. Yeah. And steaming your potatoes. Who knew? Should we rate, Delia? Let's rate. So just to remind you of our rating system, highly scientific, we have five criteria and these are usability and accessibility. That's one. Ingredients used. Are they things that you'd have around the house? Do so you have to go out of your way to find them? Aesthetics. Would you like this book on your bookshelf? Does it look nice? Is it pretty? Veggie friendliness. <laughs> and our final criteria is inspirability. So does it make you kind of want to get your eggs out and... <laughs> Get your eggs out for the last. No. <laughs> Be having you. Go spotted tick rides again. Where are you? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no so good for each oh. chef or book we change the rating to suit them so for to suit them, <laughs> to suit them. <laughs> for each chef or book we change the rating <laughs> oh, i like that i just like the idea that we've been in touch with delia's pr team and she's been like th these are the list of things you can choose from <laughs> that delia will approve of okay eggs we're gonna rate out of eggs <laughs> There's eggs everywhere. There's like something like 70 pages at the start, solely dedicated to eggs. So for Delia Smith, how not to... Not for the vegans. <laughs> no, not. There's not much for vegans in here, actually. For Delia's How to Cook, we are rating out of five eggs. So, Vic, how many eggs are you going to give Delia? How Where are you? Men... Where... <laughs> Come on. Let's wrap this up. <laughs> right. Here's my rationale. Okay. usability and accessibility yes of course she gets a point for that the yeah. whole book is about learning to cook so yes she absolutely gets a point for that ingredients used yes i had everything pretty much i just had to buy potatoes because yeah. you know i don't eat potatoes um i will say that she has a section in this book about what a cook's pantry should look like and what ingredients you should have in there and it has this, all these lovely ingredients like tabasco and there's like soy sauce in there and there's yeah. fish sauce and all these exotic things yeah. like not once really or maybe once in this book does she use those those ingredients so it's 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 a bit of a juxtaposition between what you should have and what she's actually using in this how to cook book but i had the ingredients so that gets a yes 
I'm controversially not giving it a point for aesthetics. Victoria, there are pictures everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I feel like aesthetics aren't just about pictures, right? And I love the pictures. I'm thrilled about pictures. We're finally back to a book with pictures. We haven't had one for like four books or something. But it's just so white. It's so clinical yeah, yeah. looking, this book. And like not, it's not fun. It's not colourful. I mean, obviously... Like I've said, British food is not fun or colourful. Yeah. And the, the front page is just a grey background with a boiled egg on it. Like, so yeah. it's a no from me for aesthetics. Veggie friendly, I'm giving it a yes. Because I think there's yeah. a lot of, there's a lot of stuff with vegetables. There's also a lot of um, baking and bread and things like that yeah. in here. Yeah. Uh, which I would definitely go back to, actually. I saw actually someone when I was researching her saying her wholemeal bread recipe is incredible. Like really, yeah. really very good. But unfortunately, it's a no for inspirability for me. Okay. Again, I think it comes back to it being more of a reference mm -hmm. than something I would be like, oh, I'd love to cook something from that Delia book today more of like oh I want to know how to make a roast yeah. pork or whatever Delia will know so it gets three eggs out of five from me oh. how about you I think I, on the whole I probably liked it a little bit more in general I found it quite a nice easy book to navigate and even though Joy of Cooking or something like that was great and educational and everything I think there was more that I actually wanted to cook in this book mm. I think a lot of that comes down to some of her veggie dishes are great and shout out to her vegetarian cookbook which is really really good my sister has it and we cook from it loads and some of the dishes actually appear in this book as well so I'm gonna give it a point for veggie friendliness a point for usability for sure a point for ingredients aesthetics I'm gonna give it half I know what you mean about it's very gray and yeah the, the cover isn't the most inspiring but I do like the photos and I think they're helpful and educational so mm. I'm gonna give it that and just like in terms of simply and not cramming like you know the fonts are good so yeah for boomer over here yeah. I can read it easily <laughs> and I'm gonna give it a half for inspirability because I do think I would pick it up and leaf through it because there was stuff in here we didn't really talk about stuff that we'd spotted that we might like to cook that we didn't get to make but there was things like these cheese and herb fritters love a fritter I just keep talking about fritters all the she time. loves a fritter fritter watch so there was loads of stuff that I would like to make again so I do think I'll come back to it and that's why I'm giving it four out of five eggs. Woohoo! All the eggs. Ooh. Shall we talk about our next book? Yes, please. The Chonker to End All Chonkers. Yeah, it's not the end of the Chonkers, I'm sure. But it is another one. It's just the original <laughs> Chonker. The OG Chonker. The OG Chonker. <laughs> that was my nickname in school. <laughs> different times um <laughs> I, this book oh, i just i don't even know where to begin but it, it's often i'm scared about this book i'll be honest in the world of classic french cooking okay vic's personal <laughs> hell i do like food by the way i feel like i'm on this like i don't like british food i like french food i like anything ah! But I do like food. Yeah, you love food. You just don't like the typical butter, creamy, like bland, yeah. carby stuff. You like, you know, more Asian influence, some spices, stuff like yeah. that. So like a little bit of spice. Okay, get to it, Hannah. The next book that we're talking about is La Russe Gastronomie. Ooh, great accent. Terrible. Um, I think one of the original encyclopedias of food. Yeah, literally. Literally. I haven't looked at it yet. It's been sitting in its package on my bedroom <laughs> floor because it's just so big and I'm scared to open it. And my mom had it as well again on her shelf. And I don't even think that I really looked through that one because I was just like, whoa, this looks yeah. intimidating. It's like a dictionary, right? Like the pages are like thin, like a Bible yeah. or a dictionary. I, I own it, but um, I haven't really spent much time with it. So... I'm yeah. terrified, I'll be honest, but I'm sure it'll be fine. I think it'll be okay. Probably expect some French bashing in the next one. <laughs> That's what you came here for, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> if you're still with us, you've heard it all before. Not so. the French people, just their food, <laughs> Yeah. by yeah. the way. We love the French people. Thierry Henry, hook that guy up to my veins, please. Oh, no, the Irish don't like him. Oh, why? <laughs> well, to, you know, more football chat, but he, <laughs> he handballed in a goal in this. Oh, right. Yeah, and it was... It was yeah, but have you seen him? <laughs> like, <laughs> he's my OG chonker. <laughs> we really have to wrap this up now. Sorry, yeah, yeah. everyone. Uh <laughs> Thank if you're, you if you're listening, listening Thierry we love you well Hannah doesn't but I do Delia thanks for everything <laughs> and we'll see you next time thanks for the memories <laughs> thanks for listening bye, bye. bye. let's be having you come on 
much for listening to this episode of the cookbook circle don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast and if you've enjoyed it please leave us a review as it helps others to find us you can see how the recipes from this episode turned out on our instagram at cookbook circle and if you make anything from the books we talk about please don't forget to tag us see you next time bye Bye.